have you guys back today. Um, we're going to try to move quickly because we're trying to wrap up by 12.30. So Richard, come up here. Uh, we've never done this before. Steve and I have never asked questions of someone together. So it's a first. <laughs> so I'm we're ganging, sure up, I'm I'm ganging up on you. I, I hope we don't gang up on you. We think alike, <laughs> so that's good. Um, so we're really excited to have Richard Kaufman here with us today. Richard has a long and esteemed career in both public and private sectors, including a very long and, and rich history in investing and continues to do that. Most recently, he acted as the energy czar for the state of New York under Governor Andrew Cuomo and continues to serve as the chair of NYSERDA. So we got about 30 minutes. We're just going to jump in. Um, if you get the clock running for us, that'd be great. Um, so Richard, you were brought on by Governor Cuomo in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy to help reshape New York's electric grid, which obviously they needed to be thinking about that in a very different way. Can you tell us about your tenure as New York's energy czar and perhaps the three biggest lessons of your time in that role and how that might apply to other states struggling with similar issues? Great. Well, thank and, you. Yeah. Thank you for, Welcome. Uh, for being here. Um, so I guess the governor, when he called me, uh, was really after Sandy, as you pointed out, and he really recognized that, that the electric grid was not working. Um, and that we needed to really rethink the nature of the grid in New York. Uh, costs were continuing to go up for the conventional way of delivering electricity, while the cost of distributed solutions were declining. Uh, and the system is reliable until it's not, and then it's very uh, not reliable at all. Uh, <clears throat> and so the, the mission that we've undertaken under REV is to try to figure out how to design policies to build the grid of the future, because the, the grid of Tesla and Westinghouse, that architecture, was never designed for renewables or, or for distributed resources. And so the objective of REV is a market-based approach to, to really drive capital to build the grid of the future. So the, I guess the lessons from all this would be uh, that nobody, none of the stakeholders, because I think we've made a pretty good progress in New York, but none of the stakeholders were really happy with the way the, the current system is. So in New York State, uh, the utilities don't own generation. There's decoupling. So in theory, what does it matter to the utilities about the amount of distributed generation or solar, for example, that gets put on the system? Shouldn't matter to them. But in fact, the utilities, because they're going to get revenues that are going to uh, compensate them for the cost of service and a return on capital. But even the utilities weren't happy with the current system because they could tell that, uh, that customer preferences were changing uh, and that, that uh, because the costs of the system are allocated volumetrically, uh, the more customers that would adopt their own energy solutions would mean costs would increase for everybody else. And it's not exactly the utility death spiral, but a challenge for the business model over the long term. So utilities weren't happy. Uh, the innovative energy companies weren't happy because they felt that uh, they could do a lot more and how come we just didn't continue to increase the uh, charges on ratepayers to do more. So they weren't happy with the current system. Uh, the fossil generators also weren't happy with the current system because you have a really peaky system and it meant that the fossil generators, a lot of their revenues were coming from capacity payments. And so that's not high quality revenue for them. Uh, and the business community wasn't happy either because the business community pays the bulk of the charges on, on customers. That's how it's allocated. And so they weren't happy. So when you add it all up, nobody was happy. I was happy. say, it begs the question, who was happy? So nobody was really happy. Uh, so that's one lesson, I think, for other places. I think the second lesson, and this is really critical, is that the power sector uh, we know is not very energy efficient. In fact, it's energy inefficient was never designed that way, but it's really financially inefficient. And that's really at the core of understanding REV. So as a measure of its, of its financial inefficiency is if you look at cap capacity utilization, uh, and I don't know what it is outside of New York State, but I don't think it's very different. The average capacity utilization is about a little bit more than 50%. So other capital intensive industries that we know of uh, chemicals industry, the metals industry, the airline industry, we probably know the best, uh, 
these are all industries that, because of uh, global competition, uh, have much higher average capacity utilization, 80 to 90 percent average capacity utilization. And that's been as a result of changes in business model, adoption of new technology, changes in financial incentives. And the, electric, the regulated electric sector has been protected from these forces. And what this means is that there are, in New York, if you can move to that 80 to 90 percent, you're talking about billions of dollars a year that could be used to invest in the new system, to provide compensation for the utilities, to save money for customers. And, uh, and so that's really, as I say, kind of, and maybe the third thing, and, and I'll stop, is that in theory, you know, that's, uh, that's why a market-based approach can work, get more value out of the existing, uh, out of the existing uh, money, out of the cost envelope that we're already paying. But that's really a challenge for the utilities, means a change in business model, it's a challenge for the regulators, it's a challenge for the innovative energy companies that really like the old business model. Because uh, when you start talking about using the whole bill, it changes, it changes, uh, you know, look, it, it presents a kind of systems problem uh, as opposed to just uh, 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 mandates for specific uh, technologies. So, so Rev was started, what, five, six years ago, uh -huh. something like that. In the time since then, New York has clearly become one of the leaders in decarbonization as well, along with California and some of the right. others. Rev wasn't necessarily put in place to specifically address decarbonization. But if you look back now over the last five years, what do you see as Rev's success? How has it helped with the decarbonization issue and maybe what are some of the challenges to, to address all of those things? Well, and, and to, to be clear, I mean, uh, you know, Sandy was a, was a climate event. Right. Sure. So the governor right, right. was focused in, in, in uh, setting policies that were going to result in decarbonization. Well, I'd say the, the, two, the two successes, uh, one is a clear success, the other is still a success, and if a su success can be in in, in process than the uh -huh. second in is. In the making. In the making, yeah, thank <laughs> you. So I think the clear success are these non wireless alternatives, uh, which I think most people are familiar with. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that you know, started with uh, Con Ed in Brooklyn and Queens, where instead of a billion two in substations, Con Ed went out to the market for alternative solutions, which instead cost $200 million. Uh, so that's a, a and those alternative solutions were solar storage, CHP, energy efficiency, and demand response. So that's a billion dollars in, in savings to customers, uh, improved resilience, uh, significant reduction in, in emissions. Uh, so capital planning now has changed at every utility in the state now. And there are now more than 30 of those projects going on. So that's, that's a permanent change, which which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, brings about more innovative solutions and a reduction in carbon. Uh, it's really a big number. RMI did, did that, and if every utility uh, adopted that, then it would be equivalent to the entire wind fleet in the United States. Are those mostly pilot projects? No, so when you, when you have over 30, no, this is, yeah. this is a permanent change okay. in capital planning. Uh, and the, the financial, because the system is so financially inefficient, uh, the way that these projects have evolved from the utilities uh, compensation standpoint through uh, increasingly through a share of savings, the utilities earn about what they would have earned had they deployed traditional capital. So that's, I think, a clear success and something that, you know, I'd encourage every other state to take on because this is a kind of low-cost way to move utilities into the, into the future. Uh, the, the success in the making is the value of distributed energy resource, resources, VEDER, which is the successor to net metering. You know, it's still not perfect, but it, was, it represents a big step forward because if we're going to have the grid of the future that's going to have distributed nodes, where are those nodes supposed to be? They should be in places on the grid where it's, it's not only going to be good for the hosts. Distributed energy resources are always good for the host. The question is, are they going to provide value to the rest of the system? Good, right. So looking at the portfolio of assets, and if I get any of these numbers wrong, you can correct them. Um, but we've been talking a lot about very ambitious goals that, 
different states have right. and how they're going to get there. And there's been a lot, uh, yesterday I think, some heated discussions on that. So right. if I've got it right, last year New York's electricity about 26.4% yep. came from renewables. Uh, New York's climate plan, which I know I believe is still being worked on in terms of what the actual <laughs> steps will be to get to this goal, right. but targeting, if I'm not mistaken, 70% by 2030 right. renewables. Um, even for me, that's ambitious. Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about how New York is going to achieve that, and, and if you think it's achievable by that time well, Of frame. course I have to okay. think <laughs> okay. uh, On the spot. No, it is ambitious, and I'd say, you know, I'd say a few things. One is that offshore wind, and it, this is really an amazing story in the East Coast. Uh, the, the really kind of overnight, the, the scale of, of what's happened with the development of that market. So that's a, a clearly one important piece of the puzzle. Uh, there are lots of projects, onshore projects, uh, wind and solar, utility scale solar in New York State. You know, it's really a surprise we don't have that much sun, but the costs have declined yep. so much. Uh, so the challenges are uh, transmission, which everybody knows about, but the other challenge uh, is about what's going to happen with energy efficiency. And this really goes squarely to the uh, utility business model and how utilities uh, need to change. And uh, they, under REV, utilities are really supposed to be the systems integrator. Utilities can't own DER just like they can't own large scale. Uh, so when I talk about the um, uh, non-wire solutions, so if you think about a customer bill, 15% of the customer bill is capital. Uh, six to seven percent is the utility profit. So there's been a lot of effort for the utilities to figure out how to work on that 15% of the bill that's capital and, and, and still earn a different kind of profit on, that re, on, that, on the alternative approaches to capital. But what that means is that there's 78% of the rest of the bill that's a pass-through cost on which the utility earns nothing. And about half that, or about 50% of the bill, are power costs, which are pass-throughs, pass again, on which the utility earns nothing. So, so when we talk about energy efficiency, right now in, in most of the country, energy efficiency is a, is a pro regulatory requirement. It's not a business for the utility. They do it as a matter of regulatory compliance. So under REV now, there's the opportunity for the utility to reduce, to create energy efficiency on behalf of customers and have it be a business. Now that's a big change, but it's really critical if we're going to get to the 70% number. Yeah, so, and to do that in 10, 11 years, um, so is there a group right now coming up with the strategy and when will that be released? Well, that's, uh, I mean, th that's, that's ongoing. I mean, yeah. there's, there's uh, 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 quite a lot that's going on and, and a number of pilots to, to show that, that energy can be a business. Well, for there's a lot of people in this room who'd love to help you. So Good. That, that's, you know, it, it's, it's ambitious. That's all I'm saying. And we're talking about California already has so much uh, wind and solar and can import right. and hydro. And you're in a little bit, you know, at 27%, in a little different situation. So it's a stretch. So um, I, I'd be interested to see all of the different implementations that occur. And again, so, so, so I'd like just to say one thing yeah, though, because you talk about you know the mandates, and I touched on this before. Um, you know, it's great that states have have been competing with each other with mandates for a long time, yeah. but then the question is about implementation, and and I think that you know when you think about the scale of of changing the electric grid, you know, it's on the scale of changing the telephony system or the IT system. And so government did not say, uh, we're going we're gonna to have this number of you know, modems or this number, sure. this kind of switch, right? Government set out basic policies, and the market figured out how to allocate capital and do it. And that's the, the challenge with what we've done with the electric system is that just in the same way that we've been trying to graft onto a physical grid uh, resources, distributed resources, renewables that were never intended to do that, we've done the same thing from a policy standpoint. Well, you want solar, let's graft on a right. solar policy. Or you want storage, let's graft on a, 
uh, storage policy through mandates. Well, you're not going to build an integrated system with a series of these kind of mandates. And so one of the challenges I think that we've had in New York is that we want the mandates not to drive the policy, but the policy to drive the mandates. And what I mean by that is if you have, have mandates that drive the policy, it means it really means that you wind up spending money to, to achieve those mandates, uh, as opposed to if the policies drive the mandate, you figure out, okay, we're going to change the utility business model, we're going to have value distributed energy resources. What do we think we're going to achieve as a result of these policies and then establish a mandate as a result? And the benefit of the mandate is it gives a, an economic prize and a signal to the industry uh, because they know then that uh, we're going to be there. And we tried for a long time to do things without signaling mandates and we, we wound up frustrating the uh, renewable energy uh, uh, industry. <laughs> Richard, y y this may not be quite the way to talk about it, but I think of New York as, as upstate. The best state. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No. But if you think of upstate and, and western New York, they, it looks somewhat like a lot of other states, right? Not all that different. But if you get south of Yonkers or somewhere down there, mm -hmm. where probably half of your load or more. Two thirds. Two thirds of your load is, wow. that's a whole different situation. So how do you deal with the, the diversity or discrepancies between those two parts of your state? Well, so uh, it's a great question. And, and, you know, New York is really a microcosm of the country because we have suburban, we have rural, and we have big cities. And so <clears throat> this really goes to why it is really critical to come up with a system that uh, balances the load and just doesn't uh, just doesn't try to achieve uh, 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 the objectives of climate by continuing to try to uh, add more and more renewables because we have two th we have two thirds of the generation that's upstate and only one third of the load mm -hmm. and so and that's where obviously uh, absent the offshore wind that's where the bulk of the renewable resources are so what you what you do is when you uh, if, if Business as usual would be to build much more renewables upstate where, pr where prices are already low, which, so which requires more and more support to build it. Uh, and then this incredible problem with transmission. Mm -hmm. And so it means that, uh, uh, you know, very expensive approach. And so that's why uh, looking at it on, a, on building an integrated system, which puts distributed resource, you know, again, because we're trying to transmit power over long distances into great constrained areas, that's why there's a lot of value for distributed resources mm -hmm. in load pockets. For so, non-wires. Yes, yeah, so, and yeah. so create, creating, creating the price signals to drive distributed resources in those locations of the grid that'll matter, uh, uh, turning the utilities into systems integrators, uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> you know, kind of balancing the load, uh, and again, having energy efficiency as a business, this is, these are the paths to, to trying to deal with, 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 the, with the resource and demand uh, situation that we have in the state. And, and if you push hard towards uh, <coughs> transportation, can I, can I just want to say one yeah, other thing? Sure. The other challenge is that, you know, in New York City, you know, the, the, the economic driver of New York City is not the cost of electricity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not really a problem for, it is a problem for, it's not a problem for businesses, it is a problem in terms of economic justice. Uh, the other problem is when you go further upstate, there is no load growth. And so this issue of, of cost of distributed solutions going down and uh, customers choosing to have their own energy system does create a real problem in these communities. Because if you have, uh, you know, that's, it's, these are not high income communities. And so if you start, you start losing customers, and then you have to increase the cost of the distribution system, spread over fewer and fewer customers, uh, and businesses really leave, it turns into a major, major problem uh, upstate. Major, major problem. And so that's why it's really critical, not, not just to think about the upstate, downstate problem when we mm -hmm. think about changing uh, regulations and business model, but it's also true when you just look 
at the, uh, at the utilities that serve the upstate communities. And my, my follow-up was going to be, if you, if you electrify transportation, does that exacerbate that problem? Because you have even more load down in New York City. Well, in, you know, we started, we started with trying to, uh, you know, we started with the electric, electricity system against the broader energy and, you know, climate issues in the state. Uh, we think that you've got to get the uh, sort of the grid architecture and the uh, and the IT system, and all these things in place before you before you do, can do things. do all this other stuff that you need to do with electrification of transport. You know, I mean, in in theory, if it's done right, this ought to be a good thing for for the electric sector. Uh, again, if it's done right, uh, yeah. electric vehicles. Yeah. Richard, I'd like to move for a second to finance. Um, you had a long, before you entered public service, you had a long career in finance, right. first at Morgan Stanley, then Goldman Sachs, for people who don't know, later as president and CEO of Good Energies, which mm -hmm. at the time I think was one of the largest clean energy private equity firms. Uh, in the public sphere, you spearheaded innovative financing efforts, including the creation of REV's Clean Energy Fund, um, other initiatives such as the New York Green Bank, right. and the one million, or one billion, sorry, New York Sun Solar Program. Can you tell us a little bit about these financing efforts sure. and how they played out so far? Yes, and so I touched on this at the beginning when I talked about the business community not being happy with, with uh, the way that we charge customers so, so to support clean energy. And you know, if you think about the, you have a system that's really financially inefficient and the way we're gonna support more renewable energy is by charging customers more money, right? So it it, uh, uh, it 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 was a challenge. We collected from from ratepayers much more than a billion dollars a year, most of which went into one-off projects. And so the challenge with that is that we really weren't creating scale. Uh, so New York, as big as New York is, we have no influence over the hard costs of the equipment. You know, we're not going to have an influence on the cost of solar panels or wind turbines. But states can have a really big influence on the soft cost of customer origination or financing. And so when we talk about financing and the Green Bank, which uh, really now is, has deployed about a billion dollars, uh, the, the Green Bank does not provide subsidized financing. It, it fills a gap in financing that exists because small projects, small deployment projects, not, you know, we're not talking about lending to uh, manufacturers, uh, have difficulty getting financing because it's difficult, banks are, it's like capital charges, for example, for a bank to lend to uh, a small project that has a long, long dated, uh, uh, long tenor is, you know, Impossible, and the capital in the securitization markets. Or it's, it's good to see what's happened in the solar area, but that's really the exception to the rule. So it means that there are uh, there are a number of developers that the problem that they have is not the cost of financing, but the access to financing, and that's the whole or the gap that the Green Bank yep. is is filling. As a side note, we had Reed Hunt here two years ago. Yeah. So we, you know, and he was spearheading that. I'm sure you worked with him. Quick, quick follow up, and then Steve will wrap, and we'll see if we have we take questions from the audience sure. if we have time. Um, I, just because we got you here, I, I think scale and deployment. There's a lot of that. Is you got to ramp this up. If you look out the next three to five years, any financing innovations that you think are going <laughs> to happen that we're not maybe all thinking about right now? Well, I think that the 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 complexity of project, you know, if we think about the 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 uh, what we need to finance uh, is increasingly s systems rather than specific technologies, and so a systems project financing is complicated. What I mean by a system is uh, we may have projects that are going to not only involve a, a, a combination of technologies but a combination of counterparties and a combination of revenue streams. So if you think about you know, a wholesale revenue stream from wholesale markets and re retail markets or you know, from uh, a stream from a utility and from end customers, these are complex financings. 
and the project finance world is not set up for this. I mean, they are financeable, but we're going to have to figure out how to do this in a more scalable way. Okay. Good point. Makes sense. So we've focused mostly on New York, but you've spent a fair amount of time here in Washington as well. We'll give you a chance here to sort of come back to the national level a bit, yeah. but also is there anything else that we haven't asked you that you'd like this audience to, to uh, think about? So you, you're, but you, the first part of the question is about yeah, what, 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 what would I like Washington to do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm from Washington. At the federal well, level. I, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I mean, there are obviously things that cost the carbon and so forth but I, I, that we could talk about. But I would say, I'm just going to, I thought I actually wrote a few things down. Good. Things that I, I think could be done. First, I think we need the equivalent of an air traffic control system. And that's not a good analogy because mm -hmm. that system technically isn't a great system. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is a national system that would have a standard approach to the value of distributed energy resources. That would have a standard approach to contracting uh, and standards and data security. That would enable greater development of the DER market. That would be one thing. Uh, I think that uh, a clearinghouse of best policies would be great. I mean, when you work in a state, you know, it's really hard to even travel outside of, of the state. <laughs> right. And so it would be, you know, there's nobody, you know, it's completely random that I, that we would hear about a great policy idea from another state. Mm -hmm. So that's something the federal government could do. Um, I think model regulations, you know, we've de tried to develop stuff in, in New York, um, but it would be fantastic if, if uh, there could be more of that that the, that the federal government could provide because the more we can make things the same, the cheaper the, you know, the soft costs become. Right, right. Uh, I would say the same thing, maybe a race to the top, but a race to the top for states collaborating on things like customer acquisition. We saw this with offshore wind, incredible declines in offshore wind from states' uh, friendly competition. But the same thing could be done with, I don't know, electric buses or, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. And, and so uh, just wouldn't require that much money to do that. And then finally, I think uh, a, new, a new compact with FERC because the line of demarcation between retail wholesale markets, you know, doesn't make sense when, when you have, uh, you know, electrons flowing in more direction from prosumers. Yeah. Per Prosumers. That's great. S speaking of offshore wind, really quickly, are you concerned about federal obstruction of, of, of or, or roadblocks? Yes. And and what's to be done on that front? Since we're yeah. <laughs> well, you tell me what's to be done. <laughs> okay. We'll talk more about that okay. offline. All right. We got time for one time or two questions. questions. Can I see hands uh, right back there? Well, that, so that's, those are grandfathered, those projects. I was going to just say in terms of subsidy, you know, we still, we, part of the, we still have subsidies as a bridge to the market being self-sustaining. So in the solar area, uh, we did ha we have had, we still have subsidies, but they decline based upon volume. As the industry increases its investment and costs go down, then the subsidy declines. I was just curious about, um, about the advanced metering. I think New York was the first state to open an AMI proceeding back in 2005, and now with REV, um, well, we, we haven't seen a lot of movement outside of New York City. I'm just curious, what, what do you think some of the headwinds are in, uh, in getting uh, advanced metering employed uh, upstate? Well, so th there. Advanced, meter, advanced meters are being put in upstate. Um, I think it, it's an interesting question, though, about meters, just for a second, because I talk about change in, in utility you know, business models. So the utilities are delighted to you know, put meters into the rate base. And one of the challenges that we put back to them is, well, we know that, we know that meters have value, lots of potential value. How about thinking about a business model where you get paid back in the regulated business, of course, 
from value streams that come from deploying the meters. And the utilities have been reluctant to consider that option. All right. We've hit the end of our time. Richard's okay. going to be around a little bit if you want to connect with him later. Thank you, Richard, so Thank much you. for Thank you. coming Thank out. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.